Please don't let this title scare you when it says medical oncology. I'm actually a pediatric oncologist. It's a rather long, confusing story to explain how I'm in the Department of Medicine there, but um, I am a pediatric oncologist. Um, and why is this important? Well, I would say really any new therapy that you want to develop and, and use at some point has to get approved. If it's not approved, the, the availability of that drug will become more and more limited and I would argue that at some point it's just not going to be available. So while we're going through a lot of this important research and clinical trials, we also still need to look for how we actually would get this drug approved so it will become available um, for, for years to come if it really looks like it's a, a potentially beneficial agent. So what I'm going to talk about is clofarabine. Again, I know it's not a drug used in neuroblastoma, but I think it serves as a great example of how a drug can get approved in a very small niche indication, like relapsed neuroblastoma. Um, and I'll use clofarabine just as an example. Um, again, for those of you who don't know, clofarabine was approved December 28th under what we call accelerated approval regulations. Accelerated approval simply means that there isn't enough data to show clinical benefit yet, but the data that you do have is very suggestive and supportive of that it will eventually will show clinical benefit. <clears throat> and so you can get accelerated approval. This is essentially the label for this, and again, very small patient population, uh, nothing I need to say to this group. Again, pediatric patients, relapsed refractory ALL after two prior regimens. So again, a very small niche indication um, for sure. Clofarabine is an adenosine analog very similar to two other compounds out there, fludarabine and cladribine, but yet has very distinct pharmacological properties. And in fact, when you look at cladribine, all you see is one little slight difference, a fluorine here and the sugar uh, moiety of the, of the compound, which isn't there in cladribine. But this small difference really can impact a, a fair amount of difference when you look at the pharmacological properties of the compound and compare them to other drugs that look structurally very similar. And again, I won't go into this in, in really any detail, but several years ago, we essentially went through and looked at the different targets, properties, transporters, all involved with, with this drug to try to identify, obviously, which patients may be more likely to respond to this treatment, but we compared them to, to the drugs that are already out there. And we saw a variety of differences in the pharmacological properties. This also likely translates into differences in clinical activity. Again, for cladribine, with one difference, the difference being that one fluorine group there, this drug has been shown to have activity in, certainly with patients with AML, but really not in ALL. And as opposed to clofarabine that has activity in ALL, but yet is still trying to show activity in AML. So small differences could make a really big difference in how these compounds behave. So what I'd like to do now is just sort of walk you through what it took to get this drug approved. The first studies that were started, and you can see on the top section here are the adult studies, below are the pediatric studies. As typical in um, oncology, particularly in pediatric oncology, the pediatric studies started after the adult phase one studies. Same thing when we got to phase two, the pediatric studies started about a year or so after the adult clinical trials. There was really no intent initially to get a, a pediatric label or approval in, in pediatrics. That, that really wasn't the, the major focus at the time. It was really going after adult AML patient populations, particularly elderly, which have a very refractory type of AML. However, we began to see a lot of activity in the initial clinical studies, both phase one and then in the phase two studies. We had several meetings with the FDA who actually encouraged us to keep moving forward with this. However, the, the, the one part that was difficult was that the requirement or the strong interest in seeing large randomized studies. For, for those of you who don't know, typically for full approval, you need two well-controlled, well-run um, phase three studies. And you can imagine the number of patients available to do a phase three, one phase three study in relapsed refractory ALL in pediatrics, it would essentially take us nine, 10 years to do something like that. However, we kept meeting with them, discussing the data, and eventually we decided to submit the data. And again, submitting the data essentially means writing an NDA. 
I probably have done a couple dozen INDs. Two dozen INDs do not compare to one NDA. NDA stands for new drug application. It's what you have to put together to prove you can make the drug safely, you can show the toxicology, and then in your clinical trial results, you show that there is clinical benefit there. So it was a long decision and discussion about whether we're actually going to submit this data or not. It was submitted in 2003 using what we call a rolling NDA, and I'll explain that a little bit later. And then roughly in 2004, mid-2004, we got notice from the FDA that they were inviting us to, provide, pre to present to the Oncology Drug Advisory Committee, or ODAC. And that was occurred in 2004, and I'll get into that a little bit later. And then eventually we have got into approval and some of the post-approval studies that we had to commit to. So some of the key areas I'd like to just talk about on are study designs, disease category, patient population issues, the ODAC meeting, regulatory affairs, and then corporate or sponsor concerns. Now, when we look at the study design, what we did was essentially a single-arm, non-randomized study. We looked at the primary response rate was really CR. However, we proposed using CRP. At that time, CRP, or complete response without platelet recovery, was still not an acceptable endpoint to the FDA for approval. This came out of the Mylotarg studies where some of these patients had CRP and they agreed to allow some patients with CRP in. If all you had were patients with CRP, then they were not very willing to accept that application. But if there was a few, okay. We also built a Fleming two-stage design where we looked at response rate. Our target response rate was 40% but we ran into two major issues with this whole design, and that was really clinical practice patterns. What we ended up seeing coming on to study were much more heavily treated, pretreated, highly resistant patients. Instead of having two prior or three prior regimens, these patients had four, five, six prior regimens, so they were a much more refractory patient population. And then a lot of the patients went on to transplant. The, the reason this became a key issue for us is that as patients were being treated with this drug and were going into remission, they were being whisked off to transplant. Protocol allowed it. We certainly understand that that was important and, and probably the only potential life-saving measure for some of these patients. But they never had a time to recover their bone marrow. So for those of you who understand response rates, a CR, you would essentially have to have recovery of your normal peripheral blood cell counts. They weren't having given enough time to do that because they were going to transplant. The other issue we ran into is once they went to transplant, the duration of response had to stop at that point. The FDA required that for a patient duration of response, it could not include transplant. So even though they were in remission, we had to count that as now stopping at the time they went on to transplant. They were censored essentially at that point. <clears throat> we also had a, a very rare small disease. Again, something very familiar to this group looking at relapsed refractory neuroblastoma small numbers of patients with disease. The feasibility of doing a randomized study is, is difficult at best. Um, our patient population, for ALL, we had 49 patients submitted for the efficacy portion of the NDA, 35 with AML. When it came to the safety database, we could actually, they allowed us to combine these two together. But for individual approval, they only would allow us to submit separate NDA sections on ALL and, and AML. Now, when we got our notice of the invitation to present at the ODAC meeting, um, there were several key issues that came up. First of all was response rate, and I can't underline this enough, but durability of responses. It is not enough just to have a high response rate. You have to have durability there. In other words, they're actually more in favor of a smaller response rate as long as that is very durable. And when I say durable, four, six, 12 months in length versus high response rate, but only a month in length is not very important to them. So the other thing we had to do was prepare for this ODAC meeting. Again, this was a, a very intense undertaking. Um, we had to get all the response data together we used a, what we call an independent review panel to look at all responses and also to calculate the, the duration of response. One of the key factors that became very important to us, and I think this could be very important to this group, 
is the duration of response on the most recent prior therapy before coming on to clofarabine or your particular drug. We had originally proposed this to the agency, and they said this was not an acceptable, approvable endpoint and not to do it. Well, lo and behold, when the briefing documents came back from the agency, they actually did this analysis for us. And I can't underline enough that this probably played a key role for us in that when they did that analysis, they saw multiple patients had a duration of response longer on clofarabine than whatever drug they received prior to coming on to clofarabine. And again, indicative that this drug had activity. And again, that played a key role in the overall approval of this drug in um, patients with ALL. This has also now been taken into a number of other studies. Those of you may recognize this as the Bisgrove study. Based on what we saw here, this was taken into the Bisgrove study where they were looking at using the patient as their own control. And so this, again, I think has turned out to be a very key approach and design, particularly when you're looking at small niche indications where you don't have a large number of patients to do a randomized study, can you somehow use the patient as their own control? So really, in summary of the ODAC meeting, response rate was important, but most important was the durability. Certainly, practice patterns confused the, the, the whole process in, in that patients were being taken off study to transplant. Patients were much more heavily pretreated than what we had expected coming on to the study. And differences in definition and duration of response, um, certainly between us and what the FDA had viewed, um, became very important. But again, this was probably the most important factor that the duration of response with this drug was longer than the most recent prior therapy, and that we actually had responses in patients that were refractory to prior therapy. In other words, they didn't respond at all. Now they responded to clofarabine. So in the end, the ODAC panel voted nine to six for accelerated approval, and the FDA agreed approximately two, three weeks later and granted us approval towards the end of um, 2004.